Welcome into episode three of The Fixers. I'm Jeremy Kahn, and we're going to talk joint replacement with Dr. Sam Sidney. Uh, want to get your thoughts uh, real quick on your practice and how you're yes. doing? Yes, uh, I'm from Orthopedic Associates of Central Maryland, one of the divisions of uh, Centers for Advanced Orthopedics. And I would like to talk about something that's near and dear to me, which is uh, joint replacements. If you're watching this video, you probably are either suffering or you know somebody who's suffering from arthritis. And we've got to figure out, well, it's such a generic term like I have a cold, what is arthritis? Arthritis, simply speaking, is a wear and tear or a breakdown of your joint surfaces. So if you can imagine for me for a moment the end of a chicken bone, it's got shiny white cartilage and that's a normal healthy joint. If that shiny white cartilage is gone, you're really rubbing bone on bone and that's when you start to have severe pain and most of us after a certain age, and I'm in that category, uh, you have to take something over the counter to try and alleviate your, your pain. But then it becomes more significant and life altering and you try injections or prescription drugs. And finally, when all else fails, you end up having surgery. So on purpose, I'm saying surgery most of the time is a last resort. It's when you've tried everything else, all the alternatives uh, you've tried, and it's not working, you go in for an operation. So if we will talk a little bit about hip, uh, surgery and hip arthritis. Uh, I've got a prop here which shows you what a hip joint looks like. So the hip joint, generally speaking, is a ball and socket joint where you have the ball right here which articulates to the socket. It allows unrestricted movement. And what we're going to try and do is replace that uh, joint uh, by these uh, artificial pieces through the minimally invasive method. So one of the innovations has been a development of a specialized type of table. And if I can have the illustration of a standard table, I'll show you, most of us are familiar with what a standard operating room table is like. It's a flat table, kind of like any, any bed. Uh, it, it can adjust in certain positions. But for a minimally invasive anterior hip replacement, we employ what's called a HANA table. So this is a uh, illustration where you have the table, and it certainly doesn't look like a conventional table. You have a model who's in there with her feet, in these ski-like boots uh, which hold her in place and we're allowing to change the position of the leg in many ways. So uh, in some of the pictures from my operating room I have an illustration which shows uh, the operating room where the, the legs are straight up, which you're seeing right now. So you can see those spars, the legs are straight up. Or if we need to position the leg, we can get the leg way down, uh, like so. You can see the, the, the leg, the bar is coming down and we're able to do this through a minimally invasive muscle sparing incision to replace the joint. The advantage of this is that it allows a patient to get up and get moving. There's really very little in the way of restrictions. The patient can resume normal activity fairly quickly. Yeah, it's interesting, the recovery time, you talked about being able to get back and, and do some normal stuff in your life, but um, situations are different for everyone, but what is that like I mean, uh, as far as recovery, depending on how severe? It's a great question. Uh, when I first started uh, in practice, we would keep patients in the hospital for a week to 10 days. They became good friends, actually, <laughs> you know, but nowadays, with these minimally invasive methods and better pain management techniques, we can do these operations as an outpatient or sometimes just keeping a patient overnight. So the recovery from an acuteness standpoint is, is, is much shorter, and the fact that you don't have a lot of restrictions, you can resume most normal activities fairly quickly. Well, let's, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about shoulders because this is interesting. My, my brother's actually had a ton of shoulder surgery, torn labrum, um, constantly, uh, you know, going back in, trying to get it fixed up. And I know he had that, he had to sit like this forever, you know, and, and yes. have that strap. So uh, shoulders, how, how difficult can that be? Well, they are difficult because if you just contrast these two models, you have a true ball and socket with the hip joint and you have a shoulder, and this is a, a re shoulder replacement, but the shoulder you have a fairly large ball with a shallow cup. And this is why all these surgeries, arthroscopic procedures to try and maintain stability of that joint. So you have labral reconstructions, you have decompression surgeries if you have bone spurs in order to maintain very good motion of that shoulder joint. When I come into plays, when all these sports medicine arthroscopic procedures don't work and we have to do some sort of a replacement and that's when we do these replacements. This type of replacement that I have in my hand is assuming that the rotator cuff is still working. So sometimes you have arthritis where the bone, the, the joint just wears away but the rotator cuff is intact in which case you'll do something like this. It mimics what you were born with where you replace the, the ball with a ball 
and the socket with an artificial socket. Now, oftentimes you have a situation where the rotator cuff is completely worn away, and we end up doing what's called a reverse shoulder. And the, the, the name is actually self-explanatory. Reverse in the sense that what you're born with is your socket is now your, your ball, and what was your ball is now your socket. The advantage of this is that biomechanically, it allows the shoulder to work without a rotator cuff. You're using your deltoid muscles to raise the arm, and it does not require a rotator cuff. So this has been a new innovation that allows a lot of patients in the past who couldn't have shoulder replacement or didn't have functional shoulders after replacement to have a very functional replacement after surgery. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, uh, you know, I know we see more of this when we talk shoulders with baseball players and uh, things of that nature. And um, <clears throat> I'm kind of curious of, you know, when you think about some of the guys, uh, you know, rotator cuff seems like that's a, or even a torn labrum seems like those are pretty common surgeries. And um, then obviously after having these surgeries, is there opportunity for arthritis after that because of the wear and tear? Yes, there is. It, you know, a lot of times these surgeries that are done that you're mentioning, the labrum and the rotator cuff, you're trying to salvage the joint with your own parts. And oftentimes, the younger you are, the more successful we are in doing that. But as we get older, if we have these rotator cuff injuries, they don't heal as well, or the tissue is just such that it won't cover what it used to cover. And in those instances where you really have a problem with what do we do now, and that's where these types of replacements have, have become very popular. Now, the thing that uh, I think we talk a ton about is obviously knees. We see so many knees, uh, knee injuries in sports and um, torn ACLs, MCLs, PCLs, all different things going on. But, uh, you know, you and I were having a conversation. I, my mother had double knee replacement surgery, and obviously it's, it's no peach to go through it, but sometimes it's a necessity. Well, what can you tell us about knees? Absolutely. So knees are one of the most common uh, joints replaced in terms of the large joints that are replaced. And I've got a model here that'll show you what a knee replacement uh, is. Most of us think of a knee replacement as a hinge joint. That means it just does a flexion and extension. But in truth, it does a lot of rotation and it does a front to back kind of a motion. So it's not just replacing this with a, an, a hinge. You have to put a prosthesis that'll allow all the motions that naturally occur. So what we do in a knee replacement, and this is really when, as I had mentioned earlier, the cartilage is worn, you're reshaping the diseased bone, and, and in this, for this example, I've, I've replaced it with a, a metal implant, and the upper end of the tibia is replaced with a, a prosthesis that will articulate, and it takes the place of the normal cartilage to allow painless and full motion of that joint. How about recovery for that? Does that, I mean, is it, each person is different? Each person is different, but I will tell you, it is a difficult operation to recover from. Because as you can imagine, you're trimming and shaving the bone, so it does create quite a bit of pain. And uh, the recovery requires pain medicine and a determination to get better. For any joint replacement, for any surgery for that matter, I think preoperative preparation is very important. When it comes to joint replacements, I believe knowing that you need to have a joint replacement and getting yourself mentally and physically ready is very important. And if I could dwell on that physical readiness for a moment, that would involve sometimes going to a physical therapist, going back to a gym, even though you can't exercise like you used to, building up strength before surgery is invaluable. It's been shown that that will uh, enhance and speed up recovery. So doc, uh, you know, you mentioned, obviously we're talking about arthritis and how it can affect people and uh, the reason behind arthritis and why it happens. Uh, is it as easy to say just over time wear and tear? Is it trauma or is, is it all of that? It's all of the above. I think if we all live long enough, we'll wear out our joints. A lot of times activities that we've participated in, certain sporting activities, we mentioned football or baseball injuries, sometimes high speed motor vehicle accidents will uh, promote arthritis at a much earlier age. And unfortunately, some of us develop what are called inflammatory arthritis. Arthritis. There are over 100 types of arthritis, and a lot of times the end result is a loss of cartilage. When you have that loss of cartilage, you have bone rubbing on bone, which then creates a lot of pain. Yeah, I want, I want to go back to, to hips because, you know, we have this, this issue here in Baltimore with, and we don't know the severity of the hip injury with Joe Flacco, but, you know, you do see a, a, a lot of, um, I think, I feel like at least in Baltimore, we saw Dennis Pitta go through something, uh, Joe Flacco, and it seemed like uh, the only way that I understood it with, with Pitta was about the ball coming out of the socket, correct? Exactly, and I think uh, I admire our professional athletes because, in my opinion, they're almost superhuman. It's amazing from... 
just five years ago, the advancements in medicine that we're seeing and some of these injuries, you bring up Bo Jackson and maybe things would have been different if he's playing today and he gets hurt and the opportunities could be different. I mean, we know so much about uh, hell, ACL injuries back in the 70s and early 80s was a death sentence for an athlete and now things are clearly a lot better. Clearly, I think with a lot of uh, things in our lives, technology is improving tremendously and the same thing's happening in medicine. Uh, things that we were doing years ago are now passe and things that we thought were impossible are now very possible, allowing us to maintain as high a quality of life and activity as we possibly can. So Doc, uh, when we uh, look at some of the other things that we were talking about as far as arthritis, is there, there's no fix for this, right? You're just trying, are you trying to maintain or what, what can you tell us about when you have arthritis, how do you move along uh, and, and kind of get back to what maybe you consider everyday life? All the things I've been talking about are trying to treat the effects of arthritis. To date, there's nothing that we know that can stop arthritis. We can treat the symptoms, but we can't actually stop the uh, progression of arthritis once it starts. It is my hope and belief that in time, our scientists at a, at a cellular and molecular level will figure out how we can stop that. Until that time, I do have some job security. Yeah, so uh, tell everybody, uh, you know, if they want to come see you, uh, if they have any issues, where can they find you? Yes, well, I'm a, a partner at the Orthopedic Associates of Central Maryland uh, in Columbia and Baltimore. Our phone number is 410-644-1880. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Sam Sidney for being with us today here on The Fixers. If you need more information, head to mdbonedocs.com.